Today we have uh, Professor Wen Xing Liao from Georgia Tech University to give our today's uh, month's seminar. Wen Xing is an assistant professor in the math department. She has done a lot of work in various areas in applied and computational harmonic analysis, including compressed sensing, uh, phase retrieval, spectral estimation, etc. She's also an expert in high dimensional data analysis with a lot of interesting work on deepening our understanding about the approximation power of the deep neural network with various architectures. And today she's going to present one of the most recent work in that direction. I look very much forward to your talk, Wendy. The stage is yours. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you for the nice introduction. And I want to thank all the organizers, Mark, and Rongru and Matthew and others for inviting me. It's my honor to uh, talk about my research in this online series. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about regression and the off policy learning uh, on low dimensional manifolds by neural networks. So I will tell you a little bit more about my background. So I started with image and the signal processing. And, and then I am um, worked more on machine learning in recent years. So in machine learning, we have a lot of high dimensional data. And to learn those data, then we usually uh, have the difficulty of curse of dimensionality. So, but there are a lot of low dimensional structures in the data. So my research is to develop algorithms and performance, give performance guarantees. So today's research um, uh, talk is more focused on the performance analysis. Um, my collaborators, um, a PG student Ming Shuo Chen at Georgia Tech. He is a brilliant student and he is graduating this year. And Hao Liu is a, a, was a postdoc at Georgia Tech and now he is a system professor in Hong Kong and also Professor Zhao at uh, Georgia Tech. Um, so I will start with some motivations. What is the curse of dim dimensionality? So we look at a simple example. Well, we take a little a uh, capital D dimensional cube and uniformly put samples in this cube. Uh, then the samples are represented by x1, x2, and x. For any fixed, uh, for any point x, if we look at the, the nearest neighbor distance of x to its nearest neighbor, then this quantity can be lower bounded by a constant depending on capital D in one over n to the one over d, well, n is the number of samples and d is the dimension. So you can see that as n increases, this nearest neighbor distance decays. The rate of decay really depends on the dimension. So when d is equal to one, then we'll get like one over n uh, decay. And if d is 20, so we'll get a very slow decay if I increase the number of samples from 100 to 100,000, so this nearest neighbor distance only decays from 0 0.37 to 0 0.26. So even though we have a lot of points in high dimensions, every point is still very far from its nearest neighbor. Um, but if we look at the real data set, for example, if you look at the image of this statue, then it's a 64 by 64. So you can put it in a matrix with size 64 by 64. So then if you vectorize it, you can store it using a vector in 4,000 dimension space. Um, but for a data set, which contains images of this same statue, taken from different left right poles, up down poles and lightning direction, so the data set will be very simple in the sense that every image is uniquely determined by these three parameters. So you can think all every image as a data point in 4,000 dimensional space, but they are parameterized by three intrinsic parameters. So in mathematics, we can uh, model the data as IID samples from a probability distribution supported on a low dimensional manifold. Here we use little d to represent the intrinsic dimension 
and capital D to represent the data dimension. So D is e, little d is equal to three in this example. And so today I'm going to uh, focus on some deep learning problems. Uh, deep learning has been very popular in recent years. They are used for speech recognition and face recognition and all kinds of uh, uh, applications. So uh, if we just look at the simplest uh, network architecture, which is the feed forward neural network, so basically we have an input vector x and this vector x will pass over multiple layers um, of linear transformation wx plus b after a nonlinear activation function. And so we consider ralu activation function because it, um, it's, um, it has uh, the advantage of uh, um, not having vanishing gradient in applications. And so this neural network will have the parameter uh, like W matrix and the bias B. Um, we are going to study the neural network for multiple uh, tasks. The first one is the regression. So the regression is a very uh, standard problem that everybody has seen before. Suppose we have a function y is equal to f naught x plus noise. And um, we assume that x is some random samples in a capital D dimension, and noise is a uh, random, and it's independent of the x. For simplicity, you can just use Gaussian noise, and we can further use some Gaussian noise as well. So the regression problem is to estimate the underlying function f naught, giving finite samples of the data. Of course, we need some assumptions. The function needs to have a certain regularity, otherwise we cannot just uh, estimate any random function. So generally we assume the function to be holder function, solve the function or Bessel function. So focusing on the holder function with smoothness parameter s. So you can think of it as a generalization of CS function, but s does not have to be integer. So we can split the s into the integer part k and the decimal part. So this beta decimal part, it can be one when we split it. So basically we just say that the kth order derivative of the function will satisfy the holder inequality while the power is raised to beta for the right-hand side. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, you can just think it as a CS function. And let's revisit some of the uh, standard results in regression. So if we just look at uh, data X in capital D dimensional space, then we look at the holder functions um, in this capital D dimensional space, we would ask what can the best estimator do? Then this is described by the mean max error. So for the mean max error, we are going to look at the best estimator I've had uh, for all holder functions. And so it, this uh, standard result tells us that the mean max error should be in the order of n to the negative 2s over 2s plus d, well, any number of samples, as is the smoothness and the capital D, the dimension. So you can see that the result obviously have a curse of dimensionality because we have one over capital D here. In, uh, for the upper bound, actually there are a lot of words um, to prove the upper bound uh, so, so that the polynomial estimator or relative estimator can achieve the mean max error. So, but such kind of theory uh, cannot well uh, explain the uh, real applications for example, if you look at the ImageNet data, it has 1 million images in 1,000 categories. In every image, so they are different size, but you can uh, resize them to have resolution 256 by 256. They are grayscale, also they are color images, so that we need to multiply three for the dimension. And then such a theory tells us that if you want to estimate some functions, uh, with accuracy epsilon, the number of sample we need 
need to grow exponentially with respect to dimension. So if you plug in capital D to as 256 by 256 by three, then theoretically we need a huge number of samples to make a good uh, prediction. However, um, if you look at the real uh, applications, we don't really have that much samples. We have 1 million samples, which is small compared to the uh, theoretical result. So, but, but in reality, images and the signals, they do have low dimensional uh, structure. So it's reasonable to consider that in statistical estimation. So we assume that the input vector X are located on a low dimensional manifold. Well, little d represents the intrinsic dimension. And for the function, then it's now, depend, uh, it's now defined on the uh, manifold. So we, we consider holder functions on the manifold. So for, uh, for deep learning, if we want to perform regression, then basically we set up a neural network architecture represented by this F and N and then minimize the empirical loss. Suppose we can get a global uh, minimizer F hat, then uh, the mathematical question is, how does this F hat approximate the underlying ground truth function F naught giving finite samples? And how should we set up this network architecture depending on the problem setup? So before we move to the theory, so we need to introduce some assumptions. So basically we assume that we have a smooth manifold and uh, we use the ridge to characterize some kind of the curvature of the manifold. So for a smooth manifold, the ridge is a number and basically, it, uh, with the, we can first define a media axis. So the media axis is the collection of points in high dimensional space, which has uh, two uh, nearest neighbors on the manifold. And then the range is defined to be the distance between the manifold and this media axis, okay? And so roughly speaking, range is a number. If we have a large range, then the oscillating circle should have a large radius, then the manifold varies uh, relatively slowly. And if we have a small range, then possibly we can, the oscillating circle have a small radius so that the manifold varies, uh, changes uh, fast. And then we make some assumptions. As I mentioned, we have a smooth manifold and the manifold is bounded by capital B. Then we have a positive range. So which prevents corners and the uh, uh, cusp on the manifold. And the function is a holder function on the manifold. So how do we define holder function? We just look at uh, the local chart and we define holder function on the coordinates. Um, and with all those definitions, we are going to set up a feedforward network architecture. We want to specify the number of layers, capital L, and the width a parameter is little p. So this represents the maximum number of neurons in each layer. And suppose our original function, underlying function is bounded. So we also want the output to be bounded. So this can be realized by the final clipping layer. And we, we want the weight parameter to be upper bounded by copper as well then we have a sparsity constraint for the network saying that there are at most the capital K non-zero entries in the weights. So our theory uh, um, is as follows. So with all those assumptions, we prove that if we properly set up the network architecture, such that the number of layers capital L is choosing in the order of log N, and then we have the width growing uh, polynomially in terms of n to the n to the this power. And we have this sparsity constraint and we are going to uh, uh, make the output upper bounded and the uh, weight parameter are also upper bounded, okay? So suppose we, we can get a global minimizer f hat 
we can show that the mean square error for the deep, uh, for the neural network estimator converges as the number of sample increases. So importantly, the power in this um, in this um, decay is two s over two s plus d. Well, this little d is the intrinsic dimension of the manifold. So you can see that the result is actually cursed by the intrinsic dimension in the sense that even though if we have very high dimensional data, but as long as the intrinsic dimension is very low, we should get a fast rate of convergence if you run a, a neural network uh, for the uh, regression problem. Okay, so, um, and then before we did the regression, actually our research started with the functional approximation theory. Um, in regression, we will break the error mean square error into approximation error and the variance error. So the variance error basically is about the concentration inequality. The functional approximation part uh, is to study if we have a certain network architecture. So how well we can approximate. There's a question if, um, on the last slide, I think, uh, about the last slide. Okay. Whether the, the, uh, the big O rates are upper bounds, can you take L and P higher to be safer? Um, or uh, what sort of trade-offs are there in the, in the parameters? And what sort of, no, what is the, what are the big O, uh, what's the big O notation? Oh, okay. So thank you for asking. This is a good question. So big O basically characterize the dependence on little n. So there are still some constant in this uh, big O, like they are, uh, they are actually given in the paper. So, but big O really represents the order with respect to log n. And they are choosing to balance the approximation error and also the variance in the estimation. So the larger the network is, the better we can approximate the function, but the variance will become very large if we choose a very large network. So the, they are choosing uh, to balance the approximation error and also the stochastic variance in the estimation. Good, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about functional approximation. Then there have been a lot of amazing work in this uh, direction. So uh, we, when we start uh, the approximation, so actually we uh, look at the, uh, one of the classical results by Yarosky. He proved that, that for holder, uh, for solvable function W as infinity, you can think as a CS function, they construct a neural network to appro uniformly approximate CS functions well, the computational units, so you can think it as in the number of parameters, grows exponentially in the data dimension. Okay, so, and then if you, uh, if you look at the, the practical network for ImageNet, then if you want to get 0.1 accuracy, then basically the approximation tells us that we should construct a network with, with the number of parameters like uh, exponent, which is exponentially um, in the dimension. So the, the dimension is this number 256 by 256 by three. So it's a huge number, but if you look at the practical network like AnnexNet, AnnexNet is like 60 million parameters. And the better one, VGG16 is 136, uh, 138 million parameters is much lower than the uh, the theor theoretical one. So it's reasonable to take some low dimensional uh, structure into consideration. So uh, we are very much motivated by these earlier papers. Well, they study the approximation for C2 function and the smooth activation. So for us, we take uh, CS function, holder S function, uh, which is, uh, well, the S parameter can be bigger than uh, two or uh, three, or it, it's, it's more general than C2. And we can see the ReLU network. And basically we, uh, we construct a neural network to universally approximate holder functions on the manifold. So uh, 
the difference between our work and Yarosky is that we assume that the function is on the manifold. And uh, we, our network has the number of parameters uh, growing exponentially in the intrinsic dimension, little d of the manifold. And so in, by this result, um, we, can, we can show that as long as the function is on a low dimensional manifold, the network actually only need to be very small um, and it depends on the intrinsic dimension of the manifold. And now you might be curious about how to reduce that capital D into little d in our proof. So I will show you the high level idea in our proof. Um, so the manifold is nonlinear. So we, uh, but we can tackle it uh, locally and, and then locally, basically, we can uh, use a chart to map a uh, local neighborhood of the manifold into a low dimensional Euclidean uh, space. So, uh, by, uh, to, so idea, our idea is to um, not uh, also some idea, um, some general idea of tackling the manifold is to cover the manifold by uh, some uh, local neighborhood. So for each of the na local neighborhood, we take the intersection of the manifold and a Euclidean ball. So, and then if we choose the radius of the Euclidean ball small enough, then locally we can, um, we can project the, ma uh, the manifold data onto a tangent plane. So we have a smooth manifold and we can project it to the tangent plane and use the tangent coordinate to, um, to study our function. So now the question is how do we choose the uh, radius of the manifold, right? So um, intuitively, if the manifold is a kind of flat, then we can choose large radius. So if the manifold has large curvature locally, so we should choose a small radius. So we introduce the reach and then we use some classical result to show that as long as you choose the radius less than reach over two, then you can guarantee that locally we can, um, we can project the uh, points into uh, the tangent plane and use the tangent coordinate to study the function. And so, after, uh, so you might uh, notice that when we cover the manifold, we have over, overlapping region. So, but that's okay if we use the partition of unity to uh, deal with this difficulty. So for the, the smooth manifold, we take a C infinity partition of unity associated with all, um, all, uh, all the, uh, with all the partition. And then uh, we break the function f into a sum of local functions. And each of the local function is the product of the original function and the uh, partition of unity. So by doing this, fi, a local function is just the supported uh, local uh, neighborhood. And then we, we, we are going to first project uh, um, the points on the manifold onto the tangent plane. And then, uh, look at the function on the tangent coordinate. So in this way, um, we can um, like basically locally just uh, uh, transform the manifold data into the tangent coordinate so that essentially we just need to study functions on the tangent coordinate. And the tangent coordinate is in the little d dimensional space. Okay, so on this tangent space, then we are going to approximate the function by tailored polynomials. So for Holder function HS, we break it to the integer part K and then the decimal part. We're going to approximate it with, by polynomials of order K. And then um, the next step is to uh, realize um, all those polynomials by uh, neural networks. Um, I want to mention a technical difficulty in our approximation theory. So um, one of the difficulty is that uh, if we have the, the local 
a partition. So basically, uh, we have a partition of the manifold, right? So uh, we need the neural network to decide, um, like for every point X, we need to the neural network to decide which neighborhood the point X belongs to, right? So for example, this X is here. It should belong to the uh, neighborhood with the center of the CI. Then it does not belong to the neighborhood with the center of CJ. So we can clearly see this from the picture, but for, for computers, right? So when we, we run neural network, so they need to figure out uh, just by running the, uh, the, the, the network, okay? So how do we realize this? So uh, we put an indicator function on this Euclidean ball. The indicator function will tell us uh, whether the point X belongs to this neighborhood, okay? And then the indicator function actually itself cannot be approximated by a ReLU neural network because ReLU usually, uh, so they approximate piecewise linear function. So we're going to approximate the indicator function by this piecewise linear function. And then we make an, an error here, okay? So uh, a lot of uh, our calculation was to control the error that we made here because the indicator function is on the Euclidean ball. And then actually the function is defined on the manifold. So we need to take the uh, curvature information into consideration, okay? So, and then finally, uh, we just uh, put everything together. So you see that uh, our function is actually um, break into small pieces. Well, for each of the piece, we have the indicator function, then we have the projection to the tangent plane, and then uh, for the polynomials on the tangent plane, we are going to approximate by neural network. So we are going to make an error, we're going to make errors for the indicator and for the polynomial approximation. Then after we total it up, then we can control the error. Okay, so uh, in terms of neural network architecture, so uh, we have the following um, uh, architecture. So for our, an input comes in, so we have a charge determination network, which just determines which of the neighborhood we should assign the point X to, okay? And then uh, on each of them, then we are going to run the Taylor approximation. And then we are going to pair them up and finally get the approximation. So this is a result that we uh, did before the regression. And it's just uh, for the feedforward neural network. So you might argue that uh, we, why don't we consider other network architecture, right? So for example, um, uh, convolution no residual network has been very popular these days. So we we'll consider a special type of convolutional residual network. So it has like several residual blocks. And then um, for the, um, and then basically we have convolutional operators uh, in each of these sub blocks. And then finally, we want to approximate the function as well. So for our network, our convolutional network, we didn't consider the pooling part. We just consider the convolutional operation in each of the sub network. So we can show that um, the, convolution residual network that we consider can also approximate a holder function on the manifold. So the um, so in this convolutional uh, residual network, we just need to implement each ingredient by the convolu uh, by a convolutional sub network. And um, instead of studying regression or no, we also generalize the result to binary class uh, classification. Uh, you can check our paper for that result. And so here are some discussions. Um, we consider ReLU network, and there are a lot of work uh, on smooth activation. Um, and uh, so the way to tackle them are quite different. And so our research is not able to address the computational concern at that stage. So basically we have a global minimizer and we prove that if we 
run some gradient descent algorithm to get the global minimizer, we can guarantee that the error converges in a way depend on the depending on the intrinsic dimension. So one of the major challenge is to prove or to look at the, uh, this non-convex optimization problem and to look at the, the landscape and, uh, and to see whether it converges to the global um, uh, optim uh, minimizer, then um, there are a lot of interesting um, topics in that direction. So we are not able to address at the current stage. Okay, so uh, next I'm going to talk about uh, the offer policy learning on low dimensional manifolds. Uh, so nowadays, um, when you use TikTok or Google and Amazon, they have been making a lot of recommendations for you. Sometimes, most of the time, they are making good recommendations to me. Um, so the problem of making recommendations is related with causal inference. So for causal inference, um, we have a set of covariants, which is also um, um, regarded as the features. And for, for each of the features, we want to study the causality between an action and the consequent reward. So to be more specific, we can set up the problem like this. Um, so we have a lot of users, okay, uh, for example, in the recommendation system, and each user actually has a covariant or a feature. So uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can just uh, consider the feature as a vector in capital D dimensional space, for example, like users um, age or users uh, uh, like, uh, like certain information. And we have a set of actions, A1, A2, AV. So in this example, so the action represents the video that we are going to represent to the user. So for example, I'm going to uh, take A1 as the action of recommending cooking video to a user, A2 of recommending pets video, and A3 of represent, uh, representing, uh, like recommending sports vi uh, uh, video. And after, for each of the covariants, after we make um, take an action, we are going to have a reward. So here, the reward is the time that the user spend on the video. So we are going to represent the reward by capital Y. So it's a random variable. Um, and then here, so basically, uh, we collect one of the reward, like 1.5 that the user spend on the cooking video. Okay. So, and our goal is to make recommendations. A recommendation can be represented by a policy. So a policy is a vector of the same length as the number of actions. So for example, the jth entry represents the probability of taking action aj for the covariance x. And actually it's a probability vector. So here, if we look at this user, this is the covariance. So he spent 1.5 on cooking video, uh, 0.3 minute on the past video and 0.1 minute on the sports uh, video. So I think he likes cooking more. So our policy, uh, for example, will be a vector uh, with entry 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, representing that with 70% probability, I'm going to recommend cooking video to the user. 20% probability of recommending pets video and, and so on. So then for each of the policy, we can define a reward. So the reward is basically the, uh, the expected reward. Uh, if we look at the, the, all the uh, possible covariants and also uh, the, the, uh, if we take the expectation with respect to the uh, Y. And we are going to learn a policy. So then the optimal policy will be the policy which maximizes the reward. Okay. 
And then for a specific policy pie, then we define a regret. Regret is the difference between the reward of the current policy uh, pie against the, the optimal policy pie star. So, we, so the smaller the regret is, then the better the policy is. Okay, so, so far I've been talking about the Oracle quantities because now we are taking expectations uh, and then uh, we have all the uh, distribution to take the expectation. So in practice, we have to do the learning from finite samples. So here is our data. So we have little n um, samples and the samples uh, contains the following information. So we have a covariant xi. So a covariant is just a user's information. And then we take action little ai to that covariant and then we will collect a reward. Okay, so for this data, uh, we have to be careful that for a fixed covariant, we are just going to take one single action. So we, and then collect the reward. So then we don't know the reward of other actions for this covariant. In, um, so in our research, we are going to use a, a neural network to learn this optimal policy. So uh, first we have to define an empirical reward because we don't have the Oracle reward. We have to define an empirical reward from the data and then do some uh, maximization problem to get the um, all, all empirical policy. Okay, so, um, there are, uh, this problem about causal inference actually has a long history and there are a lot of uh, um, important works on this. And I just listed a few of them, but there are more than what I listed. So um, in literature, most of the results give asymptotic performance. So for us, we are interested in giving non-asymptotic performance with finite samples of the data. And Remember that the covariant is in capital D dimensional space and the standard results are cursed by the covariant dimension capital D. So if capital D is very large, then uh, we have the curse of dimensionality again. Um, so motivated by some, um, like many applications, well, actually the users um, uh, feature have low dimensional structure. So we assume that the covariants are, are independent samples on, from a probability distribution on a low dimensional manifold. So little d is the intrinsic dimension for the covariants. And with this assumption, we have two important functions on the manifold. So first, let's look at the reward function. So for a covariant x, for the action aj, then the reward function at aj and the action aj is the expected reward if we take action a, aj for the covariant x. So since we take the expectation, this is the oracle quantity, so we do not know it from the uh, data. We have to estimate it. And the second function is a propensity score. So when our data is collected, so, it, it, uh, so the action is assigned according to certain distribution. So uh, this propensity score and the action AJ represents the probability of giving action AJ for the covariant X for in our data collection, um, uh, in our data collection process. So both of these functions are unknown because we cannot take expectation and look at the probability. So we have to estimate it from our data. So I'm going to talk more about how to estimate it. So if we can estimate it to get empirical quantity mu hat, e hat. So we are going to define an empirical reward function. Okay, so to for the maximization. So we are going to use the doubly robust reward uh, um, which was proposed in 1976. So the good part about this doubly robust reward is that as long as one of the functions, either the reward, reward function or the propensity score are exact, then the 
empirical reward is an unbiased estimator. So in practice, as long as we uh, estimate either of them very, very well, then the empirical reward is a good approximation for the oracle reward. Okay, so then um, how do we learn the policy? We have a two-stage algorithm uh, using neural networks. So giving the uh, finite samples, okay, so we, we first use part of the samples to estimate the reward function and the propensity score. And so for those two estimations, so we can use tools from regression and the classification. So the reward function is basically a function on the low dimensional manifold. So we can just estimate it using neural network. Well, the loss for regression, we take the squared loss. And then for the propensity score, so each of the uh, propensity score is a probability of taking an action. So it's like the classification problem. So we are going to learn it by minimizing the multinomial logistic loss. Okay, so after, um, of course, we need to set up the neural network architecture properly. And then after we have those two functions, we can define the empirical reward. And then in the second stage, then we are going to build a neural network to learn the optimal policy to maximize this empirical reward. So remember that the policy is actually a probability vector where each entry represents the probability of choosing, of choosing an action. So the all of the entry should sum up to one. So this is realized by uh, putting a soft max as well as showing in the final layer. Okay, so after combining everything together, so we prove the, the following result. Um, here, uh, I just uh, informally state the theorem. Uh, so there are uh, many assumptions such that as the, um, such, uh, such like uh, the manifold is a Riemannian manifold, is a smooth manifold, and the manifold has a positive reach as before. And there are two additional assumptions like the, um, each of the reward function is a holder function. The propensity score is also a holder function. Then we can properly set up the neural network architecture for regression uh, and also the classification for multinomial uh, logistic loss and also in the policy learning. Then we will be able to get a uh, neural network policy. Okay, so pi hat, this is all estimator. We can prove that with high probability, the regret of all uh, neural network estimator uh, decays as the number of sample n increases with the following rate. So here I see the smoothness of the uh, functions and little d is the intrinsic dimension. So basically uh, the central theme of this research is to get the result cursed by the intrinsic dimension. And and then you might be curious about like, uh, how does this um, result compare with the min max rate? So uh, for the off policy laying, the, uh, the min max rate when the covariant is on a low dimensional manifold is unknown, but we do find one work which proved the, the min max rate for a Euclidean case, for capital D case. So uh, for uh, when, uh, in this case, so it's just a special case. Well, uh, the mu's and the e's, the functions are assumed to be Lipschitz. So uh, s is equal to one smoothness parameter. And then the action is binary. This paper proved that the min max rate is like n to the negative one over two plus capital D. Okay, you can see that our, reach, uh, our result, so basically matches uh, the min max rate if we consider uh, like uh, the Euclidean case, right? So at least we get a match in the Euclidean case for the min max rate on the manifold, uh, it's so far unknown. 
Okay, so um, I think I have three more minutes left. I'm going to uh, summarize my talk. So today I talked about um, the low dimensional manifold model in the statistical uh, recovery. So I talked about regression problem and um, we have an extension for the classification problem. And we also have uh, off policy learning in causal inference. So in all of those learning tasks, as long as the feature or the input is on a low dimensional manifold. So we can prove that um, the estimator actually converges with a rate depending on the intrinsic dimension little d. So when little d is very small in real applications, then our result uh, should give a very fast convergence. And also on the other side, our result implies that neural network are automatically adapting to the low dimensional uh, model. So for our theory, uh, we don't really need to know the manifold. So we just need to know the intrinsic dimension for theory and also some parameters such as the rich parameters for the theory. And we can show that the result converges depending on little d. The manifold itself is unknown, but the result actually is adaptive to the intrinsic dimension, even though the manifold is unknown. So, um, and then there are a lot of open questions. As I mentioned, the computational side is not addressed in our current research. And then for real data, it might, it will definitely be more complicated as manifold. So uh, we have been thinking about what is the right way to model real data beyond the manifold, okay? So this is just a summary. And then finally, if you are interested in our paper, you can go to my webpage and then you will find our paper. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for um, all your attention. And I want to thank the organizers again for inviting me.